Hey guys, and welcome back to Psychic Cellulite Signals. This is uh, my second night in a row at the Dryden out of the middle of nowhere because they've got some awesome stuff going on. And what do they have going on tonight, Glenn? We are going to see King Kong, uh, the original, 1933, mm -hmm. uh, who feature, which features the, the amazing stop-motion magic of Ray Harryhausen and mm -hmm. the wonderful Fay Ray. Yes, and even more awesome and interestingly, Fay Ray's daughter, uh, Victoria Ruskin, right? I believe so. Yes, um, she will be here tonight, um, and she is doing a book signing, and what is her book's name? Fay Ray and Robert Ruskin, A Hollywood Memoir. Yes, and that is a new book, um, so we're very interested and excited, and... We're going to see this film on 35mm too, which is fantastic. So we'll let you know our feelings about all of that afterwards, and we'll catch you around. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to Psychic Celluloid Signals, and we just got done seeing King Kong. Glenn was going to make a correction real quick. So... I just said that Ray Harryhausen uh, animated the 1933 King Kong. He did not. Uh, Willis O'Brien did. He was a pioneering stop motion animator who Ray Harryhausen met later on and was uh, greatly influenced. Was greatly influenced by. Yeah. yeah so that's that's a different story for a different day. But that's your correction. Let's continue. Yes, and um, I think. Uh, other than that, first thing that I think should be said after going to see this film on 35mm was that it was a really, really good print. It was gorgeous. Um, I, we were both really um, impressed um, with just how clean it looked. It was it's beautiful. Impressive to think that this film was made in, what was it, uh, 1930... Uh, 1933. It's 33? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, and it's just how clean it is. Like, there's no... Not a lot of, like, you know... No. Scratchiness it's... to it. Not a lot of, like, I mean, signs seen, of I've degradation. Seen, I've seen prints from the 80s that look like they've been run through a shredder. Right. You know? And yeah. this was... I mean, yeah. Did not <laughs> in yeah. any way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, so, that was, that was really uh, a treat. Yeah. To see it that way. And not only that, but, like, uh, again, like how I said with Jabberwocky that I saw yesterday, that it's not digitally tampered with. It's just really, really nice looking, which is just really cool because if even if you are you want to go to get a, a, a nice Blu-ray copy of it, which I would, you know, say would be a dope way to watch it as well. Okay. You're still going to have been, uh, you know, digitally restored in some ways. They're still going to alter the uh, the the color values or the the grayscale in this case. They're still going to, you know, crop little bits off of certain scenes to make them fit correctly, exactly, on a disc, so it doesn't look, you know, weird on your television or anything like that, which is one thing for watching it at home but if you want to see like as as complete of uh a picture of what this film really looked like when it came out you kind of have to see it on the big the way yeah the way it did come out yeah yeah so that was that was really impressive and um yeah what what uh what else stuck out to you um Besides the fact that the, the print was pristine, uh, I think, well, um, I, was, I mean, just the entire film in, in, in itself, I, believe it or not, had never seen the, the original King Kong in its entirety. I, it was one of those films I had held out because I figured having the drive-in in town, having uh, the little theater in town, uh, and a, and a drive-in not too far away. I figured at some point I would get the chance to see it properly on 35mm on the big screen. 
Uh, and I held out for that, which might seem weird to some people, but I mean, I did. And I'm glad I did because it came true. Mm. And the film blew me away. The, the sound motion animation was so fluid. I mean, the whole effects, it was just amazing. And I mean, all the performances, um, I mean, obviously Faye Ray was amazing. Uh, I mean, all of them. And there was, it was, it was funny in parts. And it was it was thought provoking. It was moving. Like you really, um, you really felt bad for Kong, and you know, you. It just there was never a, a moment where I I fell out of the film. I was always right there, and I enjoyed every minute of it. I especially enjoyed one of my favorite parts was when uh, Kong is fighting the Tyrannosaurus Rex, and he snaps its jaw. And we're like, yeah, we're yeah, just freaking out, yeah. It was amazing, and that was the great thing too about going to the screening. Was it felt like a real, like you know, communal experience, like it should. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes now when you think you go to the theater, everyone's like, there isn't that always that that feeling. Even though I mean, you're together, but you're not. Uh, you still. You still feel like isolated from one another, and I don't know. It's just it was really really fun time, and it was obviously wonderful meeting. Faye Ray's daughter, who was an exceptional speaker, and um, it was wonderful meeting her and listening to her talk about her mother and her father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. She uh, she also uh, acknowledged how nice of a a print mm -hmm. yep. that was, yep. um, and and how awesome the Dryden is. Yeah, she talked well. She talked about her how her her mother visited the Dryden. Mm -hmm. uh, was it her 93rd birthday? On her 93rd birthday. Yep. 19 uh, years ago? Yep, 19 yep. years ago. So uh, we were a bit young. But, yeah, just a little. Um, but there were, uh, I guess, a lot of other people in the theater who had been there. Uh, someone who was in line in front of me uh, uh, getting his um, book that she came out with that I'll, uh, I'll insert a photo uh, later of the one that I got. But he had mentioned to the cashier that he was there when... Yep. when uh, when Feyre was there. I got uh, a book as well, so. Yes. Um, <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so, I, again, like you said, I felt, uh, as well, it was really awesome seeing it with, with a, a crowd of people that, that were there for, like, the whole, the whole spectrum of things from, like, the the laughing at the absurdly cheesy moments with like the awkward yeah. moments with yeah. like these these goofy men like yeah. chauvinistic just, chauvinistic in like the goofiest yeah, way yeah. possible yeah. like if if you saw that now and i imagine they must have even back then like been self-conscious of that yeah. because it was just so like cornball yeah yeah it was <laughs> um yeah and you know we got you got the funny bits of that, and then you've got um, you know certain little funny aspects in in acting or or animation or whatever. But then also you got like the really uh, like kick ass scenes like the the T right. Rex and things like that. And I also remember um, there was a certain point when um, uh, uh, one of the characters was kind of hiding from Kong. And Kong's like looking around, and then he, he reaches, reaches for it, yeah, and yeah, someone yeah. behind us, a uh, kid, like actually gasped, and I thought, yeah, that was pretty, yeah, that was amazing. I thought that was pretty incredible. This film's probably like three quarters of a century older right. than and still this has, kid, and yeah, yeah, uh, still eliciting gasps. So that was pretty incredible. I mean, the, the scene where the, the little the little kid is like it's sitting there, and like it's like you're like, oh my, oh, get the kid, get the kid. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's. Uh, it certainly still resonates and and elicits you know a response for Definitely. people, which is really cool to kind of actually observe in the real world and not just like you know tell ourselves that in our own little you know right. like dorky film communities, <laughs> uh, but to actually just be in a crowd of people and and notice this is really cool, for sure. Yeah. Um. So on the way home, we were discussing some. You know, as we do, we like to, to, to discuss theories behind, mm -hmm. you know, the film we've just viewed and what it might say about the time that it was made and, and you know, how, you know, how the time that this film was made and what was going on, you know, the, historically, uh, how it might have affected the production and, and what the message might 
B and we, you know, we like to pick apart the film and uh, contextualize it within the time that it was produced. Mm. Which can be hard say. because we're not from the 30s. Right. <laughs> and we don't want to look at too distantly like a fairy's mm. <laughs> yeah. dog. We're, we'll try not to, to do that. Um, you know, like, it wasn't really that long ago. <laughs> so. But um, why don't you start why, with what you were positing? Um, well, I feel like one of the one of the more interesting things, I guess, that I noticed that I think is interesting about this film, it's it's not uh, exclusive to this film. It's happened in other films, though this is perhaps one of the... This isn't the first example of this either. Uh, Man with a Movie Camera is an, a, a few years earlier example of this being the case, although it's much more explicit. In this film, it's, uh, I would say... Just about as explicit, honestly, but it's a lot more like, you know, taken for granted. Right. That it's the case is that this whole film is basically, or at least, a, you know, begins as a film about a guy going out to make a film. Uh, again, like I said, it's not it's not exclusive, and it's not even the first film to do something like that. But I feel like it's really interesting to to note that that's what's going on, uh, and especially like you know like the the context of uh it being more of like a hollywood thing whereas mm -hmm. like something like man with a movie camera was uh a, a soviet film it was a lot less like part of the that little um group of people in hollywood that made a name for themselves it was a lot less centralized to my my understanding when i saw the film um and uh also, like, what they're uh, actually doing is not, like, in, again, going back to, to Man with the Movie Camera in that film, they're filming a lot of things, you know, within their own society, whereas in this film, they're, you know, directly going out into other, like, remote and uh, less, you know, civilized uh, places and... Westernized. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, filming that for mm -hmm. their own crowd as opposed to, uh, filming themselves for right. themselves. Well, I think it's, again, we were talking about the, the men who were predominantly behind the film, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they themselves were like the guy who goes out and with the intention of filming Kong and ends up capturing him and taking him back. Um, they went to remote locations, uh, exotic locations, to film exotic things, and they would uh, take footage and, you know, of like, of animals, they of wild animals in the outback or whatever, you know, uh, places that they, uh, things that people in the West didn't really see. And a lot of times they'd provoke it, and that's how it happened. And then they'd come back, and people would ooh and ah over it, and um, they'd find it really fascinating because they'd never seen anything like it before. And, um, so it was interesting that they had a character that was basically them. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, um, at the very least, without uh, perhaps attaching any deeper uh, ideas onto this, is that it was sort of a reflexive film it's they're mm. they're showing themselves in mm. in their film and it's kind of interesting to see how that plays out mm. having seen uh as i was telling glenn in the car having seen like the the full film from the beginning when they're when there's this guy he's like a distinguished uh filmmaker who makes these films to the end where He's kind of unleashed, you know, <laughs> terror on New York City and caused the the death of this uh, creature as well as that people. was, you know, yeah, people in this in this creature thought to be a god by uh, a whole culture. Uh, it's interesting just to just to ponder the fact that they made this film with a character that's, you know. Mm -hmm could very well be seen as representative of them. Could be a cautionary tale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it is, but, like, for them, like... Right, right. 
uh, and which gets back to like how you're saying it's uh, kind of like if you boil it down, it can be one of those things like uh, like is there a point where you you're saying like this is we're taking things too far kind right. of thing. And it's, yeah, it's one of those types of cautionary tales of, like, is is there, like, a, a limit? Is, right. Can these things be taken too far? And it seems like maybe they're saying yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh... Well, one interesting thing we're talking about is, like, Frankenstein came up. And mm-hmm. as we all know in, in Frankenstein, uh, which came out in 1931, um... Victor Frankenstein is playing God. That is the cautionary tale. And in essence, he's he's taken things too far with his scientific endeavors, and he is doing what only God should do. Mm-hmm. In this case, we we uh, go visit a God, if you will, a, a larger-than-life creature that's very much like us, but not quite us. Um, and it's And we capture it. And we take it out of heaven, out of its its heaven, mm-hmm. we, and we again we inject it into our world, much like Victor Frankenstein injects the Frankenstein monster into his world, and in essence we play God for God kind of in this case, and we it doesn't go well. What's interesting though is uh, this God, if you want to consider God, God uh, Godzilla, King Kong, mm-hmm. a god. Is that he is not like you could say like the a Christian God. He has human qualities, but they seem to really come out once he meets Fay Ray. So it could say maybe when Fay Ray is, is begins that maybe like he seems to be kind of ambivalent towards like they're sacrificing women and mm-hmm. and, and stuff to him before and it seems like he, maybe he kills them or something. <laughs> he doesn't seem to. And I mean, we see him kill another woman and some other in various people. He doesn't seem to really care about anyone else. Mm-hmm. But Fay Ray, which mm-hmm. is which is interesting unto itself. But um, yeah, we kind of take this god that maybe was maybe uh, we kind of humanize him in, in some ways, and and we we screw things up. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, humanize isn't the right word, but you yeah. Do you get what I'm, what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're also talking about to uh, the depression and how that um, could have fit into it. Uh, saying maybe Godzilla, you know, represents the depression. Godzilla. Um, Godzilla, <laughs> oh my God. Uh, King Kong represents the depression, and uh, maybe Fay Ray's character represents uh, America or or Lady Lady Liberty, or maybe Godzilla is. I mean. Monsters, as we know, can be looked at both autonomously as a separate entity and as a reflection of ourselves. So if Godzilla is ourselves at that point in time, maybe he himself is the depression and, um, you know, maybe he's a a reflection of that. We had some other things uh, before I ramble on. We had some other things we were throwing around. Um on our way home. Do you remember any of those? Um, yeah, I think, like, there are other things to, you know, just sort of, like, notable things, like, reference to, uh, Beauty and the Beast. Yes, that's, yep. Uh, which is made reference to a handful of times, Mm -hmm. and actually, you know, like, at a handful of places, it almost seems to, like, fit in various different places throughout the plot. Mm-hmm. For instance, it's I want to say it's referenced, like really early on when they're on the ship. Mm. Uh, I think the the dress that she got mm-hmm. on yep. in the, at one point was the yep. the Beauty and the Beast dress. Yep. He was making reference to, and then later on when they're in New York before things go crazy, uh, they tell the 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 press spin this as a Beauty and the Beast story. And finally, at the end, it was Beauty that killed killed the Beast. beast. Um, Which is kind of interesting. But you could say, again, maybe an allegory for for depression. Mm -hmm. Uh, The depression, you know, uh, excess and uh, uh, 
you know, all the things, you know, all of the things that led to the economy falling. Yeah. Dramatically, uh, beauty, as in mm. lust for power, money, what have you. Uh, global expansion. Uh, Killed the beast, which is the mighty United States, right. at its at its um, prime in the Roaring Twenties, you know, um, and uh, uh, humanized by those. The word I was looking for, be humanized. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Another thing, um, I really haven't formulated formulated anything. Uh, we know to think about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anything uh whether or not it's of anything like deeper importance but the fact that the in the film they refer to kong as the eighth wonder of the world and and i believe that is even the at the very least like in the uh Mm -hmm. when they show the credits it's like the subtitle of Mm -hmm. the film itself i think that's uh i would i mean obviously that's that's of importance Mm-hmm. Um, and I imagine especially, again, as we see the film go from from where we encounter Kong to what happens to, like, you know, what we've done, what we did to that eighth wonder of the world. And uh, I feel like it can even be, you know, it can be seen through as uh, from more modern perspectives as well and in an interesting way of what these you know industrialized people went and did to this wonder of the world right well you know you know cutting down the amazon for mm-hmm. instance you know fucking up the planet mm-hmm. um fucking up other cultures going in there and you know it could be a scene as critique of we're saying of like you know imperialism or colonialism mm-hmm. yeah um yeah we tend to as humans uh we tend to if we're not careful, and we're, rare, we're rarely ever careful uh, to screw up things we touch. Mm-hmm. And it's, if, uh, even if they weren't saying per se that they were, you know, like ruining a wonder, they at the very least were saying that if we find a wonder of the world, we're going to put a concession stand in the lobby. Right. Because <laughs> uh, they, you know, it's literally what happens. Right. Uh so I think that was, you know, there's a whole lot, whole lot to this film. It's been a long time since I've personally seen this film. I was a kid when I saw it on television, which is a, you know, a crappy way to see a film in between commercials. Um, and, uh, you know, sitting down and seeing it now, there's just so much more depth than mm-hmm. I remembered. And I think I want to say I said this in the the Jabberwocky review, but if not, you know, it it does bear repeating is that, you know, when you go and see these films, like, on the big screen, you can, every little, like, nook and cranny is just a lot more evident, I I feel. Even things like just dialogue even feels almost more Mm -hmm. noticeable. Maybe because, like, you're seeing... The, the body language better mm-hmm. in in uh, relation with it, or maybe it's just because the speakers are better. I don't know, um, but I definitely would say that that it helps illuminate how how deep of a film this this really is. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially like I feel like a lot of people don't think of it as a film of much depth, right. even though it is. Uh, certainly it's respected and, and considered a classic amongst a, a wide uh, majority of people. I don't think people talk much about its depth. People talk a lot more about the effect, I think, more than anything, which right. we could have rattled down, I think, a lot about the effect. Oh, yeah. but, but I think uh, this is some territory that we've talked about that's I, I think, a little bit less. I think people tend to boil Kong down, similarly as like Godzilla. Mm. Uh, especially the first Godzilla and ones after as uh, just popcorn fare, you know, they just giant gorilla, giant monster b- battling around, you know, like crushing cities, squishing people under their feet. You know, obviously there's more to it 
especially in like the first Godzilla and 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 in, and in King Kong, than just that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we all know Godzilla is actually a very serious film, but the the American cuts with was it Raymond <laughs> Burr? I mean, even then, you still you still get a glimpse of that. I I, I, I like both versions, but mm-hmm. it's a very it's a film with a serious message, and. And King Kong is no different. Yeah, yeah. I think, if anything, King Kong is really just a film with a deep message that's been last popularly explored yes. than Godzilla. Yes. So I think that's probably a great point to leave off our, our analysis. Uh, yeah, let us know like your thoughts about any of those sorts of things. Uh, are we completely off our rockers? Is there there's some merit to some of the things that we've pointed out, or is there anything further that you think would be worth exploring, or that that you've personally realized about this film? Uh, let us know in the comments. Um, uh, otherwise, um, thank you to the Dryden. Thank you to Victoria Ruskin. Uh, yes. Very um, informative and articulate. Yes. Uh, unlike I, maybe a couple of us <laughs> at man, this I, point. But... I had a dream of being as good of a, a speaker uh, as her. Yeah. As you can tell. <laughs> so, uh, thank you once again, and uh, we'll leave that there for tonight. Keep it psychic, and keep it real, guys. <laughs>